Welcome everybody to our afternoon faculty lecture, Women Making Film History with Professor Christina Lane. Professor Lane is Professor of Film Studies in the Department of Cinematic Arts and Associate Dean of Graduate Studies in the School of Communication. Her latest book about the film industry, Phantom Lady, a biography of Hollywood producer Joan Harrison, won an Edgar Award and was selected by Library Journal as one of the best books of 2020. In today's lecture, Professor Lane will explore how women's pioneering contributions to the film industry can shed light on some of today's societal issues and expand the gender challenges and opportunities in the contemporary media landscape. Hi, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, um, Maribel, Maribel, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm talking here today about making women making film history. And I think that hopefully it will help us understand and appreciate how understanding film history can also bring a really dynamic and rich appreciation for the de dynamic debates that are happening today, playing out in, in today's media landscape. And so one of the things I wanted to start off with is going all the way back to the beginning of uh, film history and the origins of motion pictures beginning, right? And I don't know if you've heard about Alice Guy Blachet. Uh, she's actually had a resurgence recently, uh, but she began all the way back at the beginning in 1895, 1896, and she was the first filmmaker to do storytelling, the first narrative filmmaker also the first woman filmmaker. And so, you know, motion pictures started in March of 1895 when the first film was projected onto a screen in a cafe um, with the Thomas Edison present and the Lumiere Brothers present, present and also Gaumont Brothers Company present. Uh, Leon, Leon Gaumont was the boss of Alice Guy Blachet and she worked as a secretary for for Gaumont Brothers. So she happened to be there when movies were projected for the first time, but it was a really scientific moment, right? It was, there was this focus on gadgetry and kind of the technology of everything. So the story around um, Alice Guy Blaché is that as, the, as she was walking out of the screening, uh, everyone was kind of focused on the invention of, of this. And she said to her boss, well, this is all really interesting. We saw kind of documentary, we saw actualities. These are basically like eight seconds or 15 seconds of real life. But because she had been raised on literature and she'd been raised on books, she said, I just think I could do little stories. Um, do you think that maybe I could have a go at one of these cameras? And her, um, her boss said, well, I guess you could do this, but on your own time, as long as you play around with these cameras on the weekends I don't mind if you if you do experiment with with movie making and this is exactly what she did right so she worked as a secretary by day and then she would go off and, and train and teach herself um, how to make film uh, on her own and within a, a while a couple of decades of course she had made over 1,000 films including 22 feature length or full length films and she was the head of production at Gaumont Brothers. And not only that, but Alice Guy Blachet was the first person to experiment with color, the first person to experiment with sound technology. She also brought the company Gaumont Brothers over to the United States in uh, say 1907. And then she launched her own company and was the head of a studio here in the United States. So she has this incredible history, but the, the kind of sad thing about her is that by the early 1920s, she had lost her studio. She had lost all of her films. Um, she had lost the ownership of her films and really nobody remembered her, you know, by say 1930s, 1940s. And it took this resurgence in the 1960s and 70s when women were beginning to try to recover some film history that anybody knew who Alice Guy Blaché was and they began to write her back into film history. And I think that's such an important lesson for us to try to try to uh, keep 
all of this alive. And you may have heard of her just because um, two or three years ago, a documentary came out called Be Natural, The Untold Story of Alice Guy Blachet, which is a fabulous documentary. And I highly recommend you watching it if you're interested in learning more about her. And I wanted to show you a little excerpt from one of her films because she's actually quite a sophisticated filmmaker even in say 1912. So we can go ahead and, and um, put this clip on and I'm just gonna talk over it a little bit. I'm not sure how much the old movies, we can, if you don't mind taking the sound, just kind of taking the sound down um, underneath my voice, I'd appreciate it. Um, and let's see, am I going to be able to see this? I'm not sure, but it's okay. Okay, so the interesting thing about uh, Falling Leaves is it's a story about little Trixie, um, a little girl who has been told that her sister has consumption and that um, she actually hears, she's not supposed to hear this out of, um, you know, she hears an older doctor kind of telling her parents that that her older sister is going to die when the last leaf has fallen off the trees, which is kind of saying at the end of fall. So Trixie has this idea that if she leaves her bedroom and she runs outside and she spends her time tying all the leaves back onto the trees, she can somehow save her sister from dying. And I think that this is a really interesting theme um, of Alice Guy Blachet's because it, first of all, focuses on a little girl, right? It's kind of a girl power story. And also it takes this idea of her her kind of determination and her willpower and it focuses on the idea of imagination and her own creativity and this idea of fantasy and the way that she tries to change what seems to be destiny. But the other thing that I wanted to point out is that you know all old movies are not the same, right? And different filmmakers had different styles. And Blaché had a very different style than the other filmmakers working at the time, like D.W. Griffith or Edwin S. Porter. Um, and if you don't mind just taking the sound down a little bit more because we don't necessarily need, need the sound so much. If you can, I'm not sure if you can, but anyway, that's fine. Um, so one of her techniques that she used a lot was first of all, to make all the use that she could of the composition and to use both the background and the foreground. So you can see the young doctor coming in um, from the background of the frame. And then little Trixie is often in the foreground of the frame, but also to stretch out and use kind of the space on the far left and the far right. And so the, the attention of our eye is constantly drawn to the little girl and she's cueing us as to how to feel. And also we are constantly looking over at kind of the right side of the frame where the little girl is, even though the major part of the action is essentially where the doctor is giving the sister the shot, you know, and, and all the suspense around whether the sister's gonna um, manage the shot, you know, and so, it's just a fabulous way of pointing out the way that this filmmaker uses both the foreground and the background and the side to side. And um, most of the filmmakers at that time were trying to figure out how to move the camera, right? And how to create a lot of editing suspense, but everything is done within one frame here. We can stop now, um, that's enough. Thank you very much. So, if you don't mind pausing the clip. So that's a sample of her filmmaking. And some people suggest, you know, that she had a particular way of seeing, maybe, um, you know, maybe a, a woman's eye, but definitely a signature that was unique to her, to, to Blaché as a filmmaker. But here I actually just wanted to jump into this silent era of cinema, which is slightly forward from 1907 to 1927, because uh, this assumption that we often have that we make um, progress, right? We kind of advance through time and that it would be obvious to us, for example, that we're much further ahead now um, in terms of um, gender equality in Hollywood or the entertainment industry than we were 100 years ago. I think we tend to assume that we must have made some progress. But this fascinating statistic 
is that it was a much more egalitarian time in the silent era 100 years ago and that there was actual gender parity that that the gender um, makeup of the industry was about 50 50 50 percent men and 50 percent women and the reason for this was actually because of course movies were um, a young industry and they were seen as a relatively low form of um, in terms of the profession. And that meant that it was really wide open. You know, anybody who wanted to try their hand or enter this, this industry could. And women, particularly those who might be, um, you know, seen maybe women who were single, maybe women who didn't have a lot of social mobility were able to, to, to take on that adventure. And this was particularly true for studios that were opening up on the West Coast, because the truth was um, in the 1910s, most film production was going on on the East Coast, right? It was rooted in New York City. But as film production moved to Los Angeles and it became kind of this wide open frontier, a lot of studios were beckoning for new, um, new talent, you know, and new employees to come West. And so Universal, Universal Pictures was a really great example of this where they were building, they were the first studio to build um, a real huge lot and it was called Universal City. But they were also therefore the first place where we saw almost an experiment, like a laboratory in, um, in gender, in kind of a mixed gender or gender equality where there was less of a horizontal structure and more of a kind of lateral structure of um, men and women working together. And so, so much so that it was the largest concentration of, of women working in film in the country. And these women were called universal women, which I just love. So one of the women to emerge out of universal was Lois Weber. And this is just a really important figure in, um, in media history. She was the first American um, female director, right? The major studio director. Um, making films in the 1910s and 1920s. And so she made like over 130 films in her day. And she was not just a director, but also a screenwriter, a producer. She was thriving from 1914 to 1927. Um, she first started making movies with her husband, with Philip Smalley. They ran a production company together, but then eventually they they split up and she went on to run her own company. So if you were asking, well, who's who's running a studio as a woman, you know, in the early 20th century, it was Lois Weber. And many, um, many women looked back, you know, as as looking for role model models and they would look look at Lois Weber as, as kind of the figure. And I wanted to show you, and this is actually a much shorter excerpt, an example of her work, work, which is Suspense from 1913, because it's so different from what we just saw, right? It's not melodrama, but it's actually an action, more of an action film and a suspense film. And on this film, she was writer, co-director, and featured actress. So if you don't mind going ahead playing this, this is an example of a woman who has a baby and she doesn't quite know it yet, but she's a woman in peril. And there is kind of a gangster lurking outside who wants to break into the house. Her husband is in, far away working at his business. This, um, this is a, let's see, this is a film that has really interesting camera work. First of all, you're gonna see the, um, the bad guy, so to speak, you know, look up and they have this interesting meeting of, of glances. And then, let's see. Gonna look here, okay. Um, and then what Lois Weber does is rather than kind of cut back and forth between three planes of action or three action sequences, she shows it all in one, one shot, right? So we see the quote unquote bad guy, you're getting the key from under the mat. We see the husband realizing that his wife is in danger and we see the wife calling for help. And so all of this is shown to us in this kind of triangular format, which even for today is actually a really interesting choice. And then everybody races off to save to save the wife. 
well, the husband races off to save the wife. So I'm going to hop back over um, here. Uh, one, one really interesting, you know, kind of visual approach, right, to action. And one point to be made, and this is really critical for this uh, period of time, is that while you had, you know, women working in New York and women working in Los Angeles, the truth was that this was not limited to just two coasts, actually. Really, where, you know, where was this 50-50 figure coming from? The truth was that women were making films all over the United States. Um, there were there was a lot of independent filmmaking going on, a lot of regional filmmaking. For example, here in South Florida in the 1910s and 1920s, women were you know female pioneers or trying their hands with cameras. And um, Rhode Island, there were women making films. And one particular um, interesting example is Kansas City, where there were actually there was kind of a pocket of African American women filmmakers, and they were basically being supported by a really active community of African-American moviegoers and, and a Midwest distributor. So we we have um, several women making films. Um, first, um, the first African-American woman to direct a feature film was there in Kansas City, and her name was Tressie Souders. She uh, made a film called A Woman's Error, and she was a housekeeper. She was a domestic worker. And it's still not exactly known how it was that she had the means to make this movie. And the movie has been lost, but we have one frame from a woman's error. So, um, and we can hop out of the PowerPoint just for a few minutes because I wanted to basically just say, you know, like, what do we learn of these films? And, and what, is, what do we learn from the variety and the vast diversity of this kind of movie making, you know, besides the fact that all of this women's filmmaking wasn't very re well respected. I mean, we, we lost a lot of it, partly because as we're going to learn in a few minutes, um, a lot of men come into the industry and they don't respect what has come before. And that's one reason why we lose a lot of um, what I was just talking about. We just haven't held on to it and it was destroyed. But more importantly, you know, so many of the debates that we are having even today in terms of can women direct action pictures, right? Um, can women's films appeal to a wide audience or do well at the box office? Can women's topics interest a, a wide audience? What we're learning and what we need to remember is that a lot of these debates were actually had 100 years ago and they were settled you know, 100 years ago. And so it's important to look back at our history because we can help women who are emerging, men and women, right, who are emerging today and remind them that they don't have to reinvent the wheel and that they can use some of this history as inspiration and look to the past um, for inspiration. So what happens, you know, because the question is, wow, all this stuff is going on. And what exactly happens to marginalize it or or push it um and hopping back in to to the powerpoint well money <laughs> right one of the major things that happens is the coming of the studio system and the corporatization of film and you know once sound the sound technology hits the the studios and it's realized that you have a really a, a real film industry. Wall Street comes in to invest in sound, and you begin to have that factory system and a hierarchical mode of production. And so, um, as film proves um, um, profitable, right, and people see that you can monetize it, then of course. And I don't mean to sound cliche, but basically men move in, you know, a lot of investors move in and those women who were kind of quote unquote experimenting in the medium get pushed out. It becomes the age of the mogul, people like Louis B. Mayer and um, David O. Selznick and the Warner Brothers. And so the, you know, the sad fact, like the proof of this is that after everything I just described, you only have one woman director in the classical Hollywood you know, studio system. You have one woman director um, between 1934 and 1949. 
Um, the one woman that we look to really as an interesting um, filmmaker is Dorothy Arzner. And she made films actually from 1934 to the early 1940s. And then after Arzner has to retire due to illness, then Ida Lupino comes in behind her in the 1940s. So that one woman um, may change, but the statistic is still, is still one woman. But I do highly recommend that you look at Dorothy Arzner's films because they have a lot of really interesting themes about female friendships. They also just have a particular distinctive eye um, in a way of looking at things that is quite unique. And so if you're looking for suggestions for old, quote unquote, old movies, please do look, um, look for Arzner's work. But at the same time, numbers like that do not tell the complete story. And we don't want to be reductive um, by saying, well, just only one, one woman director, you know, existed at that time. And so it really helps all of us, it's, it's actually empowering to stand back and um, take a much broader view of film history and ask um, more complicated questions. And, and once we do that, we can see that the truth is, if we, if we not only look at directors, right, if we don't take an auteurist view, and we, we see who, who else was working in the studio system in terms of women, this was actually a really empowering and um, there was almost like a female wave of power in the studio system. But these women were screenwriters, they were costumers, they were, there were a lot of editors, like the head of the editing department in several studios were women. Um, women were researchers, they were in the development area, you had women agents, you had women publicists, um, journalists and gossip columnists. And of course, you had several women producers. Um, and so it helps to break things up if you say, well, gee, where were the women? And they were there. And this is actually what fueled my research into Joan Harrison, the woman that I wrote the book about um, recently, Phantom Lady, because she was one of three women producers in the studio system. The other two are listed right below. So you had Joan Harrison, Virginia Van Up, and Harriet Parsons. And I just became really drawn in by Joan Harrison because she was uh, a collaborator with Alfred Hitchcock and was so influential in Hitchcock's career. And I wanted to know what happened to her and why all of her work with him was erased and why it was that the women who worked with Hitchcock, because there were so many influential women with Hitchcock, why they had become um, marginalized, you know, in, in Hitchcock's career, why they had all become overshadowed. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of, you know, Joan Harrison's story, but also uh, uh, don't worry too much because this is just a tiny, a tiny little bit. And then we're going to keep talking about the general trajectory. We're going to keep moving along. Um, Joan Harrison's story is interesting because, you know, she answers this ad that Hitchcock had placed when he was working in London, just getting started. And he was really emerging, kind of just beginning to emerge on the world stage in the mid 1930s. So he places an ad for a secretary. Um, Joan Harrison answers the ad. She had gone to the Sorbonne, she'd gone to Oxford. She was very well educated, but also just really sharp. And she came from a newspaper family. She had wanted to be a, a reporter and her father said no, because he believed that that would be too masculine of a job. You know, and so here she is doing what the only job she thinks that she's allowed to do, which is to be an assistant or a secretary. But um, as she joins Hitchcock's team, within just a couple of, of weeks, they both realized that she was the worst secretary that Hitchcock ever had. She couldn't um, take notes. She couldn't take dictation. She couldn't answer phones. You know, she was very disorganized. But the good news around all of this was that she actually had excellent skills at story um, she had, again, kind of like Alice Guy Blachet, she had grown up on books and literature. And so Hitchcock placed her in more of a story editor role. And within just um, a couple of years, she was working on screenplays and writing screenplays with Hitchcock. And what's fascinating about her is that she is with him during these formative years. And what I suggest is that, you know, Alfred Hitchcock would not have been Alfred Hitchcock without Harrison, that Harrison helped make Hitchcock. 
and particularly helped define the two major genres um, that Hitchcock became known for, the kind of formulas that would define him for the rest of his career. One being the serial comic thriller, right, or the kind of romantic comedy thriller. Things, uh, films like The Man Who Knew Too Much or The 39 Steps or North by Northwest. And then also the gothic psychological suspense um, that usually has a woman at the, at the center of it. So The Lady Vanishes and Rebecca and Suspicion. And indeed, uh, Joan Harrison was um, instrumental in Rebecca, and she was the only person that Hitchcock brought over from England to the United States when he made that move from England to Hollywood. Aside from his wife, who I'm going to talk about in just a second, she was the only you know professional that he brought with him. Um, and it had it written into his contract that Joan Harrison would come with him to work on films. And within just one year of arriving in Hollywood, she actually made a historic um, achievement. And it's never, she, no one else has ever done this, where she was nominated in the same year for two screenplays, for Best Adapted Screenplay for Rebecca and Best Original Screenplay for um, Foreign Correspondent. And then, you know, along with, making eight feature films with Hitchcock, she went solo and decided she needed to do her own movies. And so she broke away from Hitchcock in the early 40s and became known for noirs, for film noirs. She was the mistress of suspense and went on to produce eight feature films of her own. So that's a bit about, about Harrison, but the other, the other part of this, right, is that it's it's important to understand Joan Harrison's story, and also you really can't understand Alfred Hitchcock's story without understanding Alma Revel and knowing Alma Revel's story. She was um, Alfred Hitchcock's wife, and so a lot of people don't know the importance that Alma Revel played uh, for Alfred Hitchcock, and um, to understand that um, basically you know she came into filmmaking. Alma Revel came into filmmaking four years before Hitchcock came into filmmaking. She was 16 years old when she joined a studio in London, 16 years old. And she uh, started in the editing room. And by the time she met Hitchcock within four years, she had held positions as an editor, a continuity writer, second assistant director, assistant director, assistant producer, and then this all important um, critical role of floor director, which is pretty much what it sounds like, kind of you know running, running the floor. Um, she was the only person at the time, man or woman, to hold both roles of continuity supervisor. And if I had more time, I would explain what that means. Um, and also to have held a role in the editing room. So she had this really wide idea of, um, here, I'll, if I may stop for a second. Right, she had this really, Hitchcock came into this the, the job for the first time and he saw Alma Revel from across, you know, think romantically, right? From across the, the way, uh, he, he realized just what an important person she was as a filmmaker. She was publishing articles in magazines uh, about how to make movies. So she was the first person that he hired when he was able to make his first film. And there are great stories about how, you know, they would be on the set together, the very first film that they made. And after every single shot, he would turn to Alma and he would say, Madam, was that all right? And he would wait for her to approve of the shot that they just um, took. And this was their relationship for the next 40 years, where she would green light or she would approve of every script, every editing choice, every film choice. Um, and they were true partners in the professional sense. So uh, some people have this kind of mythology around Hitchcock that he was afraid of his wife, which couldn't be further from the truth. He just had such enormous respect for her based on her, her experience. And, you know, um, I won't go into this any further. I just think that it's such an important 
a way to think actually about Hitchcock's films. You know, if you're looking at kind of the gender politics of his films, which a lot of people also reduce down to um, to suggest that maybe his films are very uh, abusive towards women or sexist towards women, but you can really begin to open that up when you think about how many women were in the room and how many different kinds of conversations they were having as they approached the themes of his films. Um, so I'm watching the time and I'm gonna hop back over here because we're, we're skating through, passing quickly through the years of Hollywood, 1949, all the way up through 1979 so we can talk much more about today. And it's unfortunately really easy to pass through this time period because between 1949 and 1979, only 0.19% of films released by major distributors were directed by women, meaning one fifth of 1% of films released by major distributors were directed by women. 7,332 films were released by major distributors and only 14 total were directed by women. Um, and, you know, a lot of those were made by Dorothy Arzner or Ida Lupino, right? The, the, the ones that I've already mentioned. So it was a really difficult time, at least for women directors. As I mentioned, they were probably, women were probably working in other areas. And, um, and so, you know, I'm focusing my my presentation today a little bit on, on women directors to try to kind of make a point about how limiting the industry has been for that sector, um, while also kind of on the other hand, trying to point to these other roles that women have, have had. But to, to focus on directors just to, to make this point, what happens is, you know, women, particularly women kind of coming into their own consciousness, coming out of the second wave feminist movement, women who wanted to go into film schools and um, women who wanted to go into say Sundance or the independent film industry in the 1980s and the 1990s began to put pressure on the industry. And there was actually this um, kind of negotiation that was made with the Directors Guild of America, this good faith effort that the, the industry said that it would make toward affirmative action. And based on some of this pressure, by the 1990s, you at least move that needle to the point where women were directing 14 films per year, right? So that's a huge leap, 14 films per year as opposed to 14 films in 30 years. And you did begin to see a lot of um, great filmmakers, women, women filmmakers in the 80s and the 90s and then Obviously, we have a lot of great filmmaking going on today. So we also have a lot of great research that's coming out today that allows us to actually measure what we see and how we can do better. And um, some of the links that I'm going to um, have, we're gonna be able to send some, some links out to you so you can actually look some of this up for yourself if you're interested. For example, the Center for the Study of Women in Television and Film at San Diego State University does annual um, research into lots of different sectors within the entertainment industry each year. And the Gina Davis Institute actually does great work as well. But uh, one of these surveys does every single year now, they're looking at basically the top grossing movies made in Hollywood. They look at the top 250 gro you know, top grossing movies made in Hollywood. And then they see how many of those are directed by women. And the answer is eight to 9% are directed by women um, now. And in fact, that has hovered around the same number for like six or seven years. It doesn't seem to change no matter what we do to try to change that figure. Um, and then if we look at the question of, well, how many of those films are produced by women? It's approximately 25%. How many are written by women? Approximately 15%. Again, when I say approximately, it's really between 15 and 16%, for example. Um, how many of those 250 top grossing movies coming out of Hollywood are edited by women? 20%. And then when, it, when we're looking at the more technical positions, such as women cinematographers, 
two to four percent. And it some years it will be two percent, some years it will be four percent. But it it does suggest that there's a lot of kind of stereotyping, right? And a lot of um, limitations that happen within the more technical roles. The numbers are even worse for women of color, showing the layers of, of gender and, and racial um, bias. So only 5% of those films were directed by black women or African-American women. Only 3% were directed by Asian American women. Now you may ask, okay, so that's Hollywood. Um, but you know, we, we know that there's a lot of work going on in documentary and independent outside of Hollywood. In fact, women have found great ways to, to get around some of those structures in Hollywood. And so I, I'm not gonna give you the, those numbers, but that is the, tr the truth is you might find that 25% of documentaries are directed by women. Um, that there's actually a lot more mobility in documentary, independent and international cinema. There's this um, abundance um, th this is actually one of the points I want to make right now, is there is this abundance of great filmmaking going on in across the board. And so if you're looking for recommendations, suggestions, and this is just a, kind of a, a very small you know, sample, um, please look for these women. And this is just a start. And you might be watching films by some of these women already. Um, so on the left, you'll see examples of where you might go. And also be, beyond the directors that are listed, these are kind of director producers, there's a great space, which is television, right? And so a lot of women are working in television, which grants them more power and more money and also more reach because audiences tend to watch a lot more television and they also put a lot more, um, Kind of credence in TV, right? They see it as a as a premium medium. Um, Shonda Rhimes, you know, has Shonda Land with ABC, and there's a lot going on in limited series television, such as you know the six part series you see on HBO. So I wanted to just give you one example, since I, I didn't want to only show you black and white movies, and you may have seen Portrait of a Lady on Fire, but we're gonna look at this. Um, and again, this is very brief. It's like less than a minute. The Portrait of a Lady on Fire was released in 2019. Dior. Go ahead. Okay. I wanted to show you that um, things. I wanted to show you that as an example, a different example of suspense. Um, I wanted to show you that as a different example of suspense, right? A different female perspective on creating suspense with the with the running. Um, but also, a Portrait of a Lady on Fire is a great example of um, a filmmaker who creates a space basically of only female characters. It's kind of a, a world of women looking at other women. And it explores um, basically, as you can see, women paint a woman painter, but it's a great analogy for a woman filmmaker. And so I don't know if you've seen it, but I won't say any more, except that a lot of the themes we've been talking about already are explored there. And, and uh, so a French filmmaker, Céline Chiama, is the director and it won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival, but also dozens and dozens of awards, which is also though to say that I could have picked any number of, of examples. That was just one that came to mind. Um, so I wanted to hop right back over, if I may, to the PowerPoint. Can we hop back over and just final slide? So, Let's see. 
it's not showing. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. We don't need it. I can just, I can just, um, <laughs> yeah, I think I did. That's fine. I can actually just let you know that I wanted to wrap up with a few, um, ways that that we can all make a difference right the question is what can we do to change um and help the industry help um those of us know for example here at this at the school of communication we have a 50 50 breakdown in terms of women and women who come in and they want to be film directors or camera operators and then by the time they're leaving film school and making their way in the world you know it's hard to let them know well the percentages are really against you but uh, research shows that there are just a few things that really do make a difference and that's the benefit of all of this research that's going on well, what is what is that right um, number one your vote counts but what that means is your vote counts at the box office so if you are going to movies or when you're getting back out there into into movies the 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 point is if um like opening weekend is really all that matters so if you're seeing something that is made by a woman or that has um topics you know that it, it interests women um go go and and pay for a ticket or take your family or even if you can't make it buy a ticket from home because studio executives repeatedly say oh well that'll never sell Right, so we're not going to invest in another movie about women, or women's films don't sell. So we're not going to invest in some um, woman who wants to make a superhero movie because we'd rather, you know, have the latest nineteen-year-old guy make that movie. Um, and so every time you see a way that you can support a female filmmaker, the best way to do it really is opening opening weekend at the box office um, because that's what studio executives read right that's what they, that's kind of the data that they read um this the truth is that that can happen while you're at home with your remote control or while you're streaming because that also helps like that counts as a vote you know so if you're watching netflix or you're watching hulu all of that goes into um, demographics or essentially that counts in terms of the eyes of executives as well um it's one positive way that you can influence the industry but I also wanted to, yeah, um, I, I also wanted to say that what research shows is number one, financing and funding is just the, the main thing that women lack. And so there are really great ways that we have financing and funding even locally. For example, within Miami-Dade, you have Ulite Arts and other local arts institutions that are funding um, and trying to reach women and other um, other folks. Um, in terms of reaching diversity. Um, but there are also bigger um, kind of New York-based organizations that are really creating huge pools of money. And you're seeing those arts organizations then fund films that get nominated for Oscars. And that creates a really great um, cycle. Um, mentoring and networking. And that's one thing that we found is that if you don't have mentors, meaning men mentoring women and women mentoring women, then you actually don't see change. But as soon as you create essentially great networks, informal and formal, as well as, as, well as these um, mentoring relationships, especially industry-based mentoring relationships, it makes a huge difference. Um, I mean, we see that in business, we see that in law, Right. But you also need to see that within the media and entertainment. Um, and also, you'll notice that this has grown a great deal and it's a huge um, it's made a huge difference It's basically like one year fellowships, uh, writers programs, diversity programs. So you'll see that ABC has like a one year fellowship. It's a pipeline that um, students or aspiring writers can earn. And then they they wind up working with ABC, for example. But almost every Every company, every corporate structure has these now. And thank goodness, because it's one of the best ways that we can create channels and pipelines. So I've um, I've spoken for far enough. Um, and I see that there are some questions. And I'm happy to take further questions because this is where the good stuff comes. I appreciate your time. And I hope that we've been um, helping to reflect kind of film past and film present. So what was the obstacle that I um, I and others face and continue to face in terms of 
learning to make a difference. Um, are, you, are you speaking specifically in terms of um, film production or film history? If you want to clarify your question. I see you're still you're still typing. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, so you know, one of the biggest one of the biggest you know, I think you might be asking why why are these statistics the way they are, right? Why why do we see what we see right now? And really, one of the biggest obstacles is just that bias continues to live on. You know, so society's biases that, for example, women um, there are notions that women just don't do well around equipment or don't actually want to make movies even though they think that they do, right? Or that they're going to um, want to um, peter out at a certain time and make other life choices. And all of these don't bear fruit. So the stereotypes, right, and the cliches actually do not bear out, but they really do work their way into hiring practices and promotion practices. And they're very hard biases to break because as I was saying, there's this self-fulfilling cycle where executives will say, well, you know, action movies by women don't sell. So they don't make them and there's not enough space to prove that they actually do. UMTV, we are now in live QA. Okay, so I'm happy to answer questions. What aspect of women's stories do I wish most people would be aware of? Wow, that's a that's a that's a tough question. Is this in terms of um, the women's film history that I research? <laughs> It's an overall question. Well, you know, again, I think one of the things that I'm I'm touching upon. Um, oh, okay. I see. This was this is um, prior to the presentation. Yeah, I think you know just to highlight some of the things that I'm touching upon in the presentation. One of the one of the things that I've learned by researching a lot of women's history, right across different periods of time is just how many different facets and how many different dimensions of women's stories we see and that there's this range of women's experiences. Um, and so I do wish to bring a lot of that to light and and also to find out, um, you know, in terms of all, you know, I mean, who knew that there was such an active community of African-American filmmakers in Kansas City, you know, and the more that we have reliable data and the more that we have you know records that are coming up through the internet and we can access them um and we don't have to wait until we travel to an archive somewhere then we can find out this information and bring it to light in a much much easier way there's a question has it been more of an opportunity or a hindrance for female storytellers in the film industry during the pandemic yeah, I think, I mean, the, one of the things that's happened during the pandemic, and I'm no expert, you know, I'm, um, my first role is as a historian, and I do film studies, but I, um, I, I've i also helped, um, helped, you know, in terms of um, the area of, of production a little bit. And what I, what I know is going on in the industry is that there was like a year where everyone needed to figure out what the guidelines and the policies were going to be within the conditions of COVID and how were you going to be able to actually make films in the proximity of other people and make sure that the equipment was sterile and what was the financing, right, economically, what was going to happen to the industry. So there was a, a lot of caution around pitching projects and putting projects through. And so when there's that kind of uncertainty, instability and caution, it's, it's never good, right? for women, for people of color, for those um, who are already in something of a disenfranchised position, um, because it's not the era of risk taking. Um, but I have heard that right now, like the fall of 2021 is a, a time when things are opening up um, and a lot more kind of development is going on and excitement and a little bit more risk taking. All right.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lane, for such an interesting presentation. Um, it was truly fascinating, and I'm really excited to read your book, Phantom Lady, which I just ordered moments ago. I'd like to thank um, all of our speakers for joining us today. Thank you all for supporting the University of Miami Alumni Association and continuing Audrey Finkelstein's legacy of lifelong learning. It is through the work of our loyal alumni family and friends that we have been able to build and offer outstanding alumni programming and services. Your commitment to the U and participation in events like this foster the institution's efforts to provide education for life, not only for our undergraduate and graduate students, but also for our alumni and others who value the opportunity to be engaged in learning throughout their lives. Please join us for the Ever Brighter campaign celebration during homecoming on November 5th to learn more about the, how the U will continue to shine as it approaches its centennial and beyond. We hope you enjoyed your UM experience, classes back in session. Stay tuned for another series coming in fall of 2022. Thank you again for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed today's lectures and your UM experience. Before you sign off and tying in with Professor Lane's presentation, here's a preview of our campaign video for the theme, Brighter Arts for the More Vibrant Culture. The University of Miami will capitalize on its unique location in a hub of diverse cultures to draw audiences to participate in and engage with music, art, performance, film, and literature, facilitating conversations through all forms of art. By promoting connection across differences and championing inclusion, we can become a magnet across the hemisphere. Let's play the video and go Canes. Cuban Heritage Collection for the first time. I felt that here's a place that speaks to me and speaks of who I am. All of our, you know, our identities are unique and and interesting. In my particular case, uh, it's been, you know, a driving question. I was born in Cuba, but I came when I was very small. I was raised in Miami, in Miami's uh, Little Havana area. My father was a political prisoner and came through Marielle in 1980, through Mary Marielle Boatlift. I think that informed my personal identity and my personal history, but just that uh, closeness to the island, even though I was not uh, raised there. The Cuban Heritage Collection is a place of a lot of pride for, for Cuban Americans. It's a place that collects and preserves cultural patrimony and cultural heritage. We are the largest collection of materials on Cuba, on the Cuban exile experience, on the Cuban diaspora, which is broad and global. So it's important to researchers, students, faculty, people from all walks of life, they are humbled by the breadth and scope of the collection. That's the crystallizing moment when they say, wait a minute, this is, this is my history here. If we can sort of inspire that in people when they walk in, but also if we can spark curiosity, I think um, that we, you know, we've, done, we've done our job. For the conductor, the most important thing is listening. What makes a great piece of music? It touches you. The hairs stand up on your arm. It makes you cry, it makes you laugh, it makes you think. You can analyze every chord, the notes that the composer writes called intervals. This interval to that, you know, we can analyze it all. But the analysis really is secondary to be able to hear it. Even though academic aspects of music are incredibly important, it is about feeling and being moved by the sounds. We, who consider ourselves artists, think that we're making a contribution to society. We're making a cultural contribution. We work in a kind of different plane, a dimension that's of crucial importance to us as human beings, a dimension that reaches us personally, spiritually, philosophically. As a human being, we should all want that. That sense of discovery, it really is 
in everything that we do. A collection of this nature ebbs and flows and breathes in the same way that life and history does. There aren't enough lives to be able to go through the richness of that collection. There's something very powerful about that. When we talk about the arts, we should fight for the things that we consider important in society, in culture, in education. If you don't fight for it, you in fact will lose it. There's always a brighter future, but we have to care deeply 